All right, my good friends, we are back in action. This is Mr. Davis, Geography. So I'm sure you've been uh, missing missing my voice. I'm sure of it. Uh, first uh, Geography video lesson of the week. So this is uh, doing this on Thursday. This is Friday's content. So this is due um, Monday night at 9 p.m. So we are going to look at these countries in particular here. We're going to look at the Arabian Peninsula. We, um, we had to leave Russia pretty abruptly. Didn't really get to talk about the um, World War I or World War II in Russia or the Cold War. Uh, hopefully we'll get to it in my regular geography class. Uh, but we had to leave it pretty abruptly because they, uh, we've gotten a lot of time cut off our, our year. So we uh, jumped into the Middle East. Now, our book is a little bit different. Most geography books will say um, it's North Africa. In the Middle East, North Africa, Southwest Asia. Uh, our book does Southwest Asia and excludes North Africa. They, they um, group Africa all in one unit. Um, but because of the desert, because of Islam that spread from Saudi Arabia into the, um, into the, um, the North African continent, continent uh, northern part of Africa, um, a lot of geography books will group this region together. Like if imagine if my map was on like Libya right here, but our, our book does not. So it just says Southwest Asia, you know, Southwest Asia by a different term um, as the Middle East. Now they don't really talk. They don't use the phrase Southwest Asia on the news. It's always the Middle East and it's always, it's never uh, too great of news out of the Middle East. It seems like, um, because there, there's a lot of fighting, a lot of tension um, in the Middle East. Um, so here is the Arabian Peninsula. So we're going to focus on Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Yemen, right across from Djibouti. Everybody loves that country. Oman, the UAE, which is United Arab Emirates, which has its tallest building in the world, Burj Khalifa, which we'll see today. Qatar or Qatar, depending on how you want to say it. Doha is their capital. And this little guy you can't even see right here. Um, Bahrain. So Bahrain. These are all Muslim nations. They're not all Sunni Muslims. They're all Muslim nations. This is the big dog right here. This is Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is literally the Walmart of oil and natural gas. Like they, um, this is not a good time for Saudi Arabia. And I might say, um, Tyler, why is this not a good time for Saudi Arabia? You are correct because oil has plummeted. Why? Because everybody's in their house. Um, I think I've worn sweatpants like 95% of the time the past, uh, you know, month or so. I'm not going anywhere. I drive my whip, my white whip is just sitting out in the driveway, uh, chillaxing, you know, my the horsepower from my Nissan Altima has not been sweating on the streets of Alexandria very much. So, they, this is not a good time because people are not buying gas. Um, China was shut down, and now the United States was, was shut down. We haven't heard too much. It would be interesting to see India, uh, if the coronavirus, what it's like in India, that's the second biggest country in the world, but it's a little off on my little tangent here. So that's Saudi Arabia here, the oil and uh, natural gas uh, Walmart of the world. Above them, which we won't talk about really today, is Iraq. It's where U.S. soldiers are today where uh, a very good, bad guy named um, Saddam Hussein operated for years and years until George W. Bush sent troops in and took uh, Saddam Hussein down. We tried to, uh, you know, uh, what's the verb here? Demo Democrat, blah, blah, blah. That was a good one. Good job, Mr. Davis. But uh, we tried to give them democracy, whatever the verb for giving people democracy is. Um, so I'm sure you'll be uh, you'll be using that outtake for a while. But um, actually, I'll just talk over it. Um, so let's see. So here is Iraq. Um, so American troops are there. Saddam Hussein was killed, but it is a very unstable country today. Iran, this is probably right up there. I would say Iran may be our biggest enemy in the whole entire world. George W. Bush called this like the axis of evil, Iraq and Iran. Um, but Iran is, um, Iran is not a country that we get along with. Um, 
Barack, President Obama got along with them a little better. He tried to, um, you know, lift economic sanctions on the country of Iran. Um, Donald Trump came right in and ripped. That was one of the first things he did is rip up the deal that Barack Obama made with Iran. So there's a lot of economic sanctions. One of the reasons why we don't trust Iran is because they can make nuclear. They have nuclear uh, capabilities. Do they have nuclear weapons? Um, I have to do a little bit more research to believe they don't really have no nuclear weapons, but they have the potential to create nuclear weapons. So we don't like them. And another thing Iran did is there anybody that like has nuclear capabilities needs to be um, watched over, have Big Brother like look and make sure that you're not doing bad stuff with your nuclear energy. But Iran kicked those uh, watchers over, those Big Brothers out of their country. And so the rest of the world kind of got very, uh, you know, concerned when they uh, kicked out, uh, I think it was UN's weapons inspectors. So we don't, we don't trust them. We don't get along with them. If, if they're in the news, usually right now, it's about um, warships. We will we'll have warships out here in the Persian Gulf and Iran might send little ships out there and, you know, instigate them, try to fight them, etc. cetera. Um, so we, we do not get along with Iran whatsoever. Uh, is, Barack Obama was kind of easing tensions on them. That was co controversial. And uh, President Trump says, no, these ec economic sanctions need to go back in place. And then over here is Afghanistan. So that is, of course, where um, where Osama bin Laden was. Uh, he wasn't actually – Osama bin Laden was born in Saudi Arabia. He was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He was going to be a millionaire. His whole life he was going to be a millionaire. Uh, but we'll talk about him a little bit later. He chose to be a, a rebel fighter instead of uh, a businessman. All right, so we're going to look at these Arabian countries. All right, so the Arabian Peninsula is known for its oil and natural gas. They don't grow a uh, really tremendous amount of food there. Saudi Arabia is a big ally, and one of the, they send us oil, and we send them food. Um, so Saudi Arabia, it is the uh, 13th biggest country in the world. Now, there's a lot of dots here, but a majority of the country is a uh, desert. The Arabian uh, Peninsula is almost entirely desert. Um, it has 27 million people. So that's kind of like the size of uh, like Florida, probably, or so. 47th biggest country in the world. Um, these are just different economic facts. They uh, produce thirty-one thousand dollars. You know, they're primarily producing oil and it's something uh, related to oil, petroleum, natural gas. And this is interesting. Um, the United States is our biggest um, trading partner. Now there was tw now this is interesting. You know, economics always has strange bedfellows. Um, Osama bin Laden was from Saudi Arabia. The there was, I think, one hijacker on the September 11 attacks in 2001. One of them got arrested before getting on the airplane. Um, 19 of them got on airplanes. How many were from Saudi Arabia out of those 19? And I'll ask Parker. You're correct. There's 15 out of 19 hijackers on the September 11 attacks came from Saudi Arabia. Yet they are one of our biggest partners in the whole entire world. We always want partners in the Middle East. We want people to be with us and not against us. Like Iran is certainly not a partner with us. Iraq, when Saddam Hussein was leading the country, they were not partners with us. So we we want partners. They're strange breadfellas because um, there's a lot of, um, they practice strict Sharia law, which is a Muslim law code that was, you know, kind of ready, created with um by in the time of Muhammad and very strict and particularly against women. So let's check out five things that women can't do in Saudi Arabia. Finally, women in Saudi Arabia, one of the world's most restrictive countries for women's rights, have some things to celebrate. They can now go to the cinema, watch the one stadium. Uh I am going to just get this up here real quick. Apologize for that. All right, so five things. Eh? Finally, women in Saudi Arabia, one of the world's most restrictive countries for women's rights, have something to celebrate. They can now go to the cinema, watch football in stadiums, drive. <laughs> These reforms are part of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's program to modernize Saudi society. 
that Saudi was not and is not an easy place to be a woman. When I was a kid, I lived in the capital Riyadh and my mum needed a letter of permission from my dad to go anywhere with us. So here are five things that Saudi women still can't do. You can use a car, you just can't buy it. As without the permission from your male guardian, you can't open your own bank account. This is because of Saudi Arabia's guardianship system. In a nutshell, this means every woman has a male guardian who makes crucial decisions for her. As you can imagine, the human rights campaigners are really, really against this. Another example of guardianship is... You can drive to the airport, but good luck getting on a plane without your male guardian's permission. So you want to get married? Well, you need the okay from your male guardian. And that could be your five-year-old little brother. And what if that ends badly? You'll need permission to divorce from your husband. Your McDonald's, your Starbucks, families and single males have to fit in different areas. And all women have to fit in the family area. If not, you could be arrested. In public, you don't need to cover your face, but you do need to be dressed from head to toe. So if you fancy a trip to the beach, there's no chance of wearing a bikini in a country that averages 45 degrees. One thing, in practice, some women in Saudi Arabia may do these things. And if you're foreign or rich, it definitely is easier to bend or break these rules. On the flip side, if the government wants to, it can apply these laws much more strictly and harshly. So being able to drive is great, but Saudi is still very much a man Great. All right, the most so uh, ladies, probably not a country you would want to uh, check out because they're very discriminated against women very heavily. This is a picture down here of uh, Mecca. This is pilgrims making the Hajj to Mecca. This is their flag. Every Islamic flag will have these colors, either white, green, red, or black. And if you uh, go on CIAFactbook.com, it'll explain why that is the case. So we're going to move down here. So in, in every country, I included like the description of their country, but I'm not going to focus on that right now. All right. So next, they're uh, kind of at the, the bottom of the peninsula is Yemen. Yemen is right across from Somalia. Yemen is a, a country that was Saudi Arabia is very strict uh, and has its act together, major world trader. Yemen is kind of chaotic. Um, a lot of violence in Yemen, a lot of terrorist activity in Yemen. Um, there are different rebels that fight uh, people and like soldiers from Saudi Arabia. It is a place that is a um, far cry from Saudi Arabia. Um, it's very tiny. It's about two times the size of Wyoming. Uh, they do have a decent uh, population, uh, 25.4 million. That's kind of interesting there that they um, they have almost the same amount of people as Saudi Arabia. Their unemployment is uh, astronomical, though. It's 35%. They only make $2,000 per person, basically. They trade with uh, China, and they also produce some oil out here in the Gulf of Aden. And then on their borders, I'm sure there's some oil. But the problem with them is that their government is not as functioning, uh, as functional, I should say, as Saudi Arabia. So they struggle to uh, to produce oil cheaply, efficiently, and they don't have as many trading partners in Saudi Arabia, and them don't exactly get along. So unfortunately, it is a hotbed of terrorism because any place where there's a non-functional government, you know, Terrorists can just operate without really fear of being discovered or being Saudi, UAE, like caught. So this uh, just happened this couple of days ago, I believe, or about a month ago. So this is uh, a plane that was, I believe, shot and, and shot down and in has Yemen. Gone down in Al Jaf Governorate in the northeast of Yemen. Houthi rebels say its forces shot down that uh, Royal Saudi Air Force plane, and the Houthi media also talking about thirty civilians killed in coalition airstrikes in a district in the same region. We'll talk to Hassan al Bukhati, a specialist in Yemen and uh, Houthi affairs, joining us from Sana'a. Can you tell us more about that, first of all? This talk of 30 civilians killed in coalition airstrikes, was that a, a, a retaliation airstrike? 
Uh, yes, it seems to be that was a retaliation uh, air strike uh, because just yesterday after the uh, Yemeni armed force here in Sanaa shut down the Saudi tornado uh, fighter jet, there was eight air strike on the on the wreckage of that fighter jet. I think they were tried like to hide uh, any evidence, uh, but in the early hours uh, of the morning, they have targeted uh, several homes uh, near that area, and I believe that they were uh, trying. Uh, I just want to just uh, mention that there are uh, some unconfir unconfirmed reports here circulating in Sana'a that one of the pilots was injured and he was captured uh, by Sana'a forces and I think that's why uh, Saudi has conducted a massive wave of airstrike on areas near that, uh, the wreckage of that fighter jet because they believe that they want uh, either to kill this uh, uh, pilot and maybe they had some uh, belief that he might be uh, captured in those areas. That's why there was 35 uh, civilians uh, who were killed. Uh, many of them are women and children and several uh, civilians as well were injured in that wave of airstrikes. At this stage in the conflict in Yemen, how important, how big a deal is it if the Houthis did actually manage to shoot down uh, a Saudi warplane? Um, uh, the, here, the, the spokesperson of uh, Yemeni army in Sana'a has uh, uh, said about uh, 30 minutes ago that they will release in the coming hours uh, footage of the shooting down and the launch of the missile and the shooting down of that uh, fighter jet and as well, they will show... All right, so uh, in the, just in this interview, you can kind of see how how populated, how congested. This is in Sana'a, which is their capital. So um, Saudi Arabia and Yemen have a longstanding conflict. And usually the conflicts boil down in these countries by in just between the Muslim groups. And it's usually um, Sunni versus Shia. Uh, and the Houthis are a Shia group. And the Houthis, if we go back, so the Houthis are a, a rebel group. Um, and if you go back up here, if I can get back to here real quick. Um, Iran was is funding Houthi rebels down here in Yemen, and Iran is Shia, and the Houthis are Shia. If that is not right, I'll correct it. But Saudi Arabia is Sunni, and that, therefore Iran and Saudi Arabia, the two gigantic countries in this region, do not get along whatsoever. All right, so let's go to, oh, man. Oman, there's a good uh, Carl Aziz pun for you on this Friday. Oman is uh, very tiny, smaller than the size of Kansas, uh, so smaller than the size of Kentucky in terms of population, 3.1 million. We have about 5 million people, so they only have 60% of our population. Uh, unemployment's relatively high. Their GDP per capita is pretty decent, $29,000, 51st in the world, and Usually when you have oil and you have a small population, you're going to have a high GDP per capita because that oil gets divided in just into a small population. They're a big trading partner. Again, you see China gobbling up a lot of oil and natural gas. Um, if you if we had a bigger map, China is not that far away. They're both kind of on the, in the, can get into the Indian Ocean very quickly. Their transnational issue uh has been there's they've had a problem continuously between the united arab emirates here and um uh, and oman's border um and their capital is muscat all the cities for the most part are right on the coastline interestingly enough though the water that people drink actually for the most part comes from the desert they drill down into the desert floor and there's aquifers in the bottom of the desert floor and that's where they get their water from. It's very costly to take the salt out of the water like the Arabian Sea. So most countries get their water from the bottom of the desert floor and not from the sea. So let's check out Oman here. Man. What's good in your mind about adventure is the landscape. You can see the difference of the colors between the sea and mountains and sky. We are lucky we have this place. The food is very colorful. Influence coming from Africa, Asia. We have that old cocktail mix. When the sun sets, you enjoy the different in colors. Sometimes you just sit there and forget about time. 
and you will never get bored of it. We are now in uh, the western Hajar Mountains. You drive from the, the capital city, which is Moscow, and the landscape just changed completely. Great shapes and deep canyons and beautiful cliffs. Everything is like working together to make it beautiful. The Via Ferrata is an Italian word and it means the Iron Way or the Iron Road. A stainless steel cable attached to the rock. When you climb up behind you is the Grand Canyon of Arabia. Beautiful views all the way up. Every place in Oman have different nature. Musanda, this is special because fjords and mountains, I feel myself in a different form. When I'm young, I'm starting to fishing with my family, with my father and my brother. The fish is important in everything. Omani food is very diverse. We are blessed, alhamdulillah, with great seafood. You know, like we have 1,800 kilometers of coastline. That's if you count it this way. But if you do it this way, I think it's 3,200. <laughs> Traditionally, people would put food in one dish. People would eat together. Food connects people. When I'm climbing, I feel like I'm free. And it gives me an idea about how small I am on these mountains. We are a mixed culture of people. We are known to be travelers. Every day when I come to the fjords and I go and say, wow, I forget everything behind me. Just I am thinking for this time what I'm leaving. Oman, actually, all of Oman is nice and beautiful. Mountains and desert and beaches everywhere. The landscape inspired me a lot because it's just beautiful. All right, so that is Oman. So that would be a pretty cool place to check out. A lot of cool, awesome sites there. Let's go to uh, the UAE, United Arab Emirates. You've, you've heard about this one. Abu Dhabi is their capital. We're going to check out the largest building in the world. It's pretty crazy here. Um, they are almost the same size of us in terms of their population. Uh, but, they, but they are smaller, though no, uh, they're probably main is a little bit bigger than we are. So, um, very similar to the United States or to Kentucky in terms of population and land size. Um, they have a really good GDP, almost 50,000, a little bit uh, right behind us. They trade with Japan. Japan has like zero natural resources, so Japan gets has to get their oil and natural gas from other places. Um, they get a lot from Canada, um, but uh, U the UAE also sends a lot out. There's tons of oil and natural gas out here in the Persian Gulf, and that is why these people are, are so wealthy. Um, their issue in their country is there's a lot of uh, uptick in drugs in their, um, their country. This is the Burj Khalifa. If I uh, mis mispronounce it, they will correct me here, but this is pretty cool. I was like looking at stuff like this. This is the tallest building in the world at the time of this video. At 2,716 feet, the Burj Khalifa is the tallest structure ever built on Earth. Towering over the city of Dubai, it has the highest observation deck and the highest restaurant in a skyscraper. And its owners say it has the highest swimming pool in the world. Is there room for tall buildings like this that aren't just, you know, a landmark yeah. or something beautiful to look at, but that actually function and are efficient and profitable? I think there are. I think I think nowadays there are people are building smarter. Smarter and more efficient. Muhammad Alabar built the Burj at an estimated cost of $1.5 billion. Its doors opened in 2010. Today it was, I don't know, 110 degrees. How do you keep this cool? 
Well, of course, it's, it's a combination of good design to start with, good advanced mechanical uh, electrical system, of course, most advanced uh, skin uh, on the building. So the makeup of the curtain wall, the type of glass we are using, the way it reflects heat, all that is a combination of advanced technologies and monitoring the building every single hour. Using an innovative thermal ice storage system, the tower is currently kept cool with the equivalent of 13,000 tons of ice. The Burj is monitored 24 hours a day in a main control room, where engineers measure everything from power and water use to wind speed and seismic activity. On a windy day, the top of the tower can move up to six feet in either direction, and the base is designed to shift in the event of an earthquake. You get a little nervous when there's an earthquake in the end? I used to, now I trust it so much, because recently, uh, last week, we had a, quite a good movement in town. Getting to the observation deck on the 124th floor takes only about 60 seconds in one of the tower's 57 elevators. Its specially designed lifts can move up to 12,000 people a day and even act as a power source. They're actually creating power? Of course they create power and then the power goes back to the grid of the system that we have, like in part of the building as well. Alibar explains how the Burj Khalifa captures water from outside the building itself in Dubai's sweltering humid air. We take great pride in the condensation that, that happens on the skin of the building. They get collected and we, get, we use it for our irrigation system and the whole development. What we collect is equivalent to almost 20 Olympic pool sizes of condensation on the skin of this, of this building. And, and it's very valuable when you live in the desert, of course. And while it's only been open for four years, he's already thinking of building bigger and better. Height is something very special for human beings. I think technology has improved. We can do much better next time. All right, that is some pretty wild stuff. I always like uh, checking out that, that kind of stuff. All right, uh, and there's a lot of earthquakes in this region, so that's why they um, have to think about stuff like that. Uh, and uh, Qatar... Uh, Qatar is the number one ranked country in the world. Um, I think this year maybe um, Liechtenstein might have taken over the top spot. Or Monica, I can't remember, but I'll, I'll double-check on that and put it in the video. Uh, when I made this uh, PowerPoint, it was uh, Qatar or Qatar. Uh, very similar type of um, buildings. They have such a small population that um, this is one of the questions in your book the other night they actually have to import workers. So only one out of five workers working in Qatar are actually from Qatar. They get a lot of men coming from the Philippines actually to come in and build these things. And Qatar is also gonna be hosting the World Cup, which it was very controversial because they have no soccer history. Um, it's like 120 degrees in the summer. So the World Cup, the next World Cup is gonna be played in uh, December. Um, I have to think, I think it's not this December, but a couple to maybe the following December. I have to double check on that. Um, but again, you see Japan also trades with Qatar. You should have watched the video about the Qataris already and how wealthy they are. So the last country is Bahrain. Uh, Bahrain is the, actually the island. And we're going to watch a, uh, uh, video called the impossible bridge from national geographic. Uh, it's about three and a half times the size of. DC, 